So when we see sickness, war, famine, broken families, drought, plagues, all of those are expressions of a dying world. Coming our subject for today, going the distance. What did I say? Going the distance. Come on, what did I say? Going the distance. This is based on Romans 12, 18, which says this, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That applies not only to us, but to God. Let me say it again. That verse does not only apply human being to human being, it applies God to human being. The Bible says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, not with your enemy, in you, live peaceably with all men, and that applies to God. And tonight we will see how God did as much as possible to live peaceably with us. Going the distance. Before I begin, do three favors for me. Favor number one, please turn off all cell phones. Favor number two, please pray for me while I speak and simply say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number three, what is that? Yes, we want you to think. We want you to think. Let us pray. Holy Father in heaven, I have one desire, one intention, and that is to preach the truth and allow the truth under the guidance of the Spirit of God to do its work in every listening heart. Please, dear God, speak through me and bless all those who came in a very special way. Father, bless those who are visiting with us for the first time. I pray that your spirit will touch their hearts. Bless them in all areas of their lives. Let us leave this place tonight knowing we have met with you. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen and amen. What's our subject? Going the distance. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 5. We shall begin reading at verse 1. Isaiah 5, reading at verse 1, from verse 1. And in obedience to what I was told, give you time to find it. But if you take long, I'll just have to keep moving. All those on this side who found Isaiah 5, say amen. amen. If you found it over here, amen. and over here, amen. all right. And now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a winepress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, and men of Judah, Judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Now as we read verse 4, keep in mind our subject. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? That's the question God is asking. This little song represents God's interaction with Israel. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. The vineyard is Israel. Look at verse 7. For the vineyard is of the Lord is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. The house of Israel, the Israelites, were his vineyard. He had a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, Canaan. Remember, it was a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. So it was a fruitful hill, that's what it's called. And he fenced it. He surrounded the Israelites. And biblically, the fence or the hedge means the law of God. Let me say it again. The hedge that surrounded the Israelites, if they would leave it undamaged, was the law of God. And he fenced it. First thing he did. And gathered out the stones thereof. He drove out those other nations and planted it with the choicest vine he put the israelites right in that fruitful hill the choicest vine being the israelites and built a tower in the midst of it the tower was the temple 
and also made a wine press therein and he looked in other words having done all these things god had a right to expect good grapes good fruit christ-like lives godly behavior a righteous nation so having done these five things he fenced it gathered out the stones thereof planted it with the choicest vine built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein having done these things which represent all that god could have done he was going the distance then god says now i expect that you would produce godly lives and so the Bible says, and he looked, he expected that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. God did not get what his investment suggested he should have gotten. You have children, you raised them in a safe environment, you gave them a good education, gave them all they needed, and they turned to crime. And you just can't figure out how that happened. You raised them in the church. Kept them from uh, destructive influences. And they turned to crime. And they turned to drugs. And they turned to alcohol. And they turned to whatever. And you just can't understand. But I gave everything necessary. I provided everything. God goes through that. You know with whom? You know with whom? with us because he has provided everything in one person name that person Jesus Christ and now God has a right to expect that our lives would reflect him would come up to the level that he has set for us and so we read in verse 4 the verse 3 and now O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah judge I pray you betwixt me and my vineyard here is God here are the Israelites here is God here are we it's almost a court case and God is saying based on the evidence you judge come to an honest conclusion was there anything else I could have done the obvious answer is no and now O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more? God is simply saying there is nothing else I could have done. Now, God is omnipotent. What does that mean? What does that mean? He's all-powerful. God is omniscient. What does that mean? He knows everything. And God is omnipresent. What does that mean? in his own way he's everywhere how can an omniscient omnipresent an omnipotent god run out of options but that's what happened to him when he provided everything for the israelites god said there is nothing else i can do remember our first romans 12 18 if it be possible as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men God desired to live peaceably with a race of sinners and he devised a way he went as far as he could he went the distance what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done it wherefore when I looked that it should bring forth grapes brought it forth wild grapes and this is God's complaint how can I provide everything necessary to produce a blessed people and what do I get a rebellious people what he complained about then he complains about today because God has provided in the person of Jesus Christ everything you and I need to live a life that pleases God and honors him let's take a look at the distance to which God went as we continue with the subject going the distance Philippians chapter 2 Philippians 2, we shall read from verse 1. Our key verses are 3 and 4, but we'll make a connection. Philippians 2, reading from verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love 
being of one accord, of one mind. Listen to three. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, Paul is describing the kind of attitude that should exist in the church. Now he goes to verse 5, very well known. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I've asked you before to read the Bible microscopically. Paul does not say, let this mind be in you, which was similar to the mind of Christ. Because a donkey is similar to a horse. But it is not a horse. It is smaller, slower, less dignified looking. Are you with me? A zebra is similar to a horse, same family, but it is not a horse. It is not an Arabian, the most distinguished of all horses. It is not. The Bible doesn't say, let this mind be in you, which is similar to the mind of Christ. It has to be the very mind that Christ had is the mind we must have. Let me point out one of the tragedies of sin. Sin has affected the mind so catastrophically that there's some things we absolutely refuse to accept because of sin, even though they're biblically accurate and true and God believes them. One is, it is difficult for Christians to believe it is possible to live a sinless life. Almost no one believes it, even though the Bible calls for it. Let me say it again. Because of sin, our thinking has been so adversely affected and the quality of our thinking so lowered, it is hard for the Christian to believe it is possible by the grace of God to live a sinless life. In other words, a life identical to the life that Jesus lived when he walked on this earth. But this is God's goal for us. Jude, which has one chapter, verse 24, Now unto him that is able to do what? Keep you from falling and to present you faultless. The carnal mind will not believe that the power that said let there be light is in that Bible you're holding right now. Same power. The carnal mind will not believe that it is possible to forgive the worst offenses and have a clean heart towards the person who caused the offense. The carnal mind will not believe that. The carnal mind believes, okay, I'll forgive, but get out of my sight, which is not the way God forgives. God forgives and says, now let's reestablish the relationship the way it was. What am I saying? I am saying because of sin, there are some biblical truths we will not accept. One of them, we find it hard to accept the extent to which God expressed his love for a fallen world, a sinful world, a world that regarded him as the enemy. Now listen to Paul. Let this mind, the same mind Jesus had, is the mind we must have. Let this mind be in you and me, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, now he begins to describe the mind, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He goes from being equal with God to being at a human level almost nothing. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross what we're describing is this divine being called Christ equal with the father and that's as high as you can go he leaves voluntarily that high position lays down the independent use of his power. Notice my words carefully chosen. Lays down the independent use of his power 
leaves that up to the father and comes as one of us not born in a palace not even born in a hospital but in a manger as an expression of his love for us but let me intensify that love when the bible says let this mind be in you we need to identify that mind as clearly as we possibly can and that mind is described in verses 2 and 3 listen verses 3 and 4 listen to verse 3 of philippians 2 as we continue with going the distance let nothing be done through strife or vain glory what is vain glory looking for honor from men looking for someone to put you up high and pat you on the back and say how nice you are and how sinless you are vain glory the bible says nothing should be done with that as an aim in hebrews chapter 5 i believe it's verse uh, 6 the bible says christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest of first i think that's if, if uh if hebrews 5 5 he did not glorify himself he sought no high position the verse says verse 3 philippians 2 let nothing and i mean nothing be done through strife of in glory now you all belong to churches of some kind is this strife in your church on the church board between different peoples different tribes different parts of the city different levels of education different whatever is this strife in the church the bible says let nothing nothing be done through strife or vain glory but in lowliness of mind this is verse 3 of philippians 2 in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves now you talk about a mission impossible that's it because the carnal mind esteems no one better than itself the carnal mind works the opposite way it esteems itself better than everyone including God but the Bible tells us the mind that Christ had which is the mind that God had because I and my father are one and Christ came to show us the kind of person the father was so the mind of Christ is the mind of God it is described in verses 3 and 4 in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves meaning this is another thing the carnal mind will not accept in the plan of salvation as God went the distance he developed a plan to save the world that included the risk of losing his son forever if that is what it took to save sinners in doing that God placed our interests listen to me carefully above his son I can hear you fighting that God placed our interests above his son let me explain what I mean when Jesus came to this earth he had two natures what were they come on what were they human and divine meaning that he was both man and God he faced temptation as man he became hungry as man he slept as a man he went fishing with the disciples as a man he resisted the devil as a man he prayed to his father as a man because God doesn't pray to God the human Jesus prayed to his father he died as a man he raised himself as God can you say amen no human being can raise himself he was God and man now in his humanity Jesus Christ did not know everything some Christians say well the father knew and Jesus knew he would come back he would not sin yes divinity knows everything but remember Christ was human and divine and he lived on this earth as a human being which means 
in his humanity, Jesus did not know. Why do I say that? In Luke chapter 2, the Bible, I think it's verse 40, the Bible says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Listen again to the verse. He increased in wisdom and stature. Someone who knows everything cannot increase in wisdom. Did I lose you? Let me say it again. Remember favor number three. What's that? Someone who increases in wisdom does not know everything. In his humanity, Jesus did not know everything. He had to learn. He had to learn what his origin was. You are God. He had to learn you made that flower. His mother taught him. When he was on that cross, he did not know if he would come back. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating blood, he did not know if he would survive it. Despite that, he went through with it, knowing that the risk existed that he would never come back from the grave. But he went because the verse says, if it be possible, read the rest with me, as much as lieth in you. And the only distance that represents the greatest distance is self-sacrifice. And Christ was willing to lose it including himself if that is what it took to save us and so he died on that cross but even though he did not know what would happen what were his final words into thy hands i commend my spirit by the way when you find yourself in an impossible situation and you're god's child you can do no better than to say what christ said father into thy hands i commit this situation into thy hands, I commit my unbelieving husband. Into my hands, I commit my boss who continually harasses me. Into thy hands, I commit this and that and that. When you reach the point where you're helpless, commend it into God's hands. Can you say amen? And Jesus on that cross, not seeing beyond the tomb, all he knew was there was a father who loved him. And he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And he died. He was willing to lose everything. And the father was willing for that to happen. Because when he cried, if it be possible, remove this cup from me, clearly the father said no. My brothers and sisters, God went the distance. Jesus Christ went the distance in his love. To demonstrate to us his desire to save us someone willing to die is paying the ultimate price and cannot expect to come back and Jesus was willing to suffer that because he loves you the parable of the lost sheep tells us Christ would have done the same thing if only one person had sinned one now that's love that is love so when the Bible says, for God so loved, how do you define so? You define so by looking at that cross. Let me say it again. God did that because he loves you. Forget the persons all around you. He did it for you as an individual. The carnal mind rejects that because that's not the way we love. We love conditionally. God loves unconditionally and so God and the Son went the distance to demonstrate their love and to provide a pathway of salvation for a planet that viewed God as the enemy the Bible says while we were yet enemies enemies Christ died he did not wait for us to try to reconcile he died while we did not like him so that by that act of selflessness he might attract us to him and so first john chapter 4 verse 19 says we love him because 
He first loved us. In dwelling upon Calvary and the suffering of Christ and the death of Christ, when you dwell on that with an honest mind, it generates in the heart a love for that man, Jesus, who gave everything to save sinners. Tonight, God is saying to you and to me, I have gone the distance. What more could have been done in my vineyard or to my vineyard that I have not done in it? When God gave Christ, what else was he to do? Nothing. God ran out of options when he gave his son. Listen to the well-known verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, one of a kind. He had no begotten sons left. The angels are not begotten sons. We are not begotten sons. He had one begotten son. And we understand that by looking at the life of Abraham. In Hebrews 11 from verse 17, if you'll go there quickly, Hebrews 11 verse 17, the Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. The Bible has two only begotten sons. One real, that's Christ, one symbolic, that's Isaac. How did Abraham give up his only begotten son? He had two sons at the time that Isaac went up to the mountain to be killed by his father. One was called what? Ishmael, and the other was Isaac. But when God called Abraham in Genesis 22, and he said, Abraham, he said, behold, here I am. He says, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. God knew he had two, but only one was to be the begotten son. You cannot have two begotten sons. And so God deliberately said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. Why? Because Isaac would come back from the grave. Actually, Isaac came from the grave in the sense that according to Romans 4.19, Abraham's body was dead. Sarah's womb was dead. Are you with me? Out of a dead loin, on a dead womb, came a living man. Come on, say amen. Isaac came from the dead. Because Christ is God's beloved uh, begotten son because he came back from the dead. And so we see in the experience of Abraham having more than one son, but God regards one as begotten, the only one. And he was told to sacrifice that son. Jesus Christ is God's son like no other being is. And God gave him, not loaned him. God gave him and for all eternity Jesus belongs to us let me say it again for all eternity Jesus is a member of the human family not the angel family not the angel family Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took the seed of Abraham. He is a member of the human family even while he's God. He is not a member of the angelic family. Even though the angels are sinless and higher than we are, all of this suggests and teaches us the extent to which God went to save us. Or I should say to make salvation available to anyone who will accept it. That is why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation at such a cost? When you reject that salvation, here's what God does. Let's go back to Isaiah 5. We read verse 4. What could have been done more in my vineyard to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now listen to verses 5 and 6. When someone rejects that salvation, that love, and now go to verse 5, Isaiah 5. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be broken down. And take away the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down, or shall be eaten up, and the hedges removed. T break, take away the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. Verse 6, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, 
but it shall come up briars and thorns and I will command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. God is saying, if you will not accept my love, my salvation, all that I have done, then I will act the very opposite and give you what you want. Why do I say give you what you want? If you're thirsty and dying and someone brings you a cup of water to save your life, your choice is drink the water and live, don't drink the water and die. You say no to the water, what are you saying yes to? Death. God says, when you say no to Jesus, you're asking for the very opposite, which is death. So I will give you what you want. I will lay it waste. First line of verse 6. It shall not be pruned nor digged, and there shall come up briars and thorns. And I will command the clouds. This is not accidental. Some people say God doesn't destroy. Mm. God says, I will command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it, that you become a desert. From a fruitful vineyard to a desert. Why? Because you rejected life. Now here's death. Proverbs 8, 36. All they that hate me love death. And so God says, if you don't accept Christ, then clearly your choice is destruction, death, hell. Here it is. Tonight... As you think of going the distance, God has demonstrated his love so powerfully that there was nothing else he could do to demonstrate it. You know, there's a book I love to read called Education, written by a lady called Ellen White. She makes a statement that when I first read it, I was almost dizzy. Page 76, uh, paragraph three, I believe it is, three or four, and she writes these words. Listen carefully. Christ came to the world with the accumulated love of eternity and nobody said amen <laughs> well let me explain what the statement is saying how long is eternity does it have an end no and yet the statement says god by sending christ gathered up all the love of an eternity and sent it in Christ and so Christ came to the world with the accumulated love of eternity and they still said no amen <laughs> it's okay at least you've heard in another statement she says in sending Christ God exhausted his benevolence hmm. you know what benevolence is goodwill towards people goodness towards people now God is infinite his goodness is infinite yet she writes he exhausted his benevolence when he sent Christ for you do you understand that God loves you passionately your mother can't love you that way your father can't the combined lovers all family members cannot compare God's love for you is measured in the fact that he sent someone equal with himself and that person is your brother Jesus Christ who's also God and so tonight God is saying here is Christ Christ represents life blessings security now and in the life to come here is death eventually choose one why choose death when there's life why turn your back on a God who has gone the distance to save you because he is miserable without you do you understand God can't live without you when I say that I mean he prefers not to be he prefers not to be without our presence God wants us with him more than any other created being he wants us with him let me repeat more than any other created being more than the angels more than those who live on other planets where people never sinned God desires a closeness with you than he desires with angels or unfallen beings how do you slap God in the face and say no If God desired an intimate relationship with angels, he would have made Christ in the form of an angel. 
Christ came in the form of humanity. By that act, he has brought us closer to God than Adam was when Adam stood in the Garden of Eden sinless. I must repeat that, but let me say it differently. By taking humanity, that's Christ, that's humanity, he took it. Christ brought us closer to him and to God than Adam was when Adam stood sinless in the Garden of Eden because in his sinless condition, Christ was not human. Did you hear me? Christ was not human. When sin came, Christ identified with us as Savior or Adam would have been destroyed immediately. He eventually came as a human being. The humanity of Christ puts us closer to God than any other intelligent being in the universe. Mm -hmm. Now when you say no to that kind of sacrifice, do you not understand why the only alternative God has is destruction? Accept Christ. Yield to that love. That is God going the distance. If it be possible, and there was the possibility of saving us. As much as life in you, send someone equal with myself. Live peaceably with all men and Christ is our peace with God can you say amen Christ is our peace with God and so God can live peaceably with those who accept Christ remove Christ and there is warfare between us and God let me say it again remove Christ and there is nothing but warfare and destruction between us and God of course the destruction coming from God to us I thank God for Christ Jesus he is the only means by which we can be saved it is because of Jesus God can give you and I give you and me the smallest blessing it is because of Jesus that the Sun is where it is it is because of Jesus that the world still turns it is because of Jesus that you can listen to me tonight it is because of Jesus that every blessing comes upon the human race whether it is the Sun rising on the just the unjust the rain falling on the good and the bad it is because of Jesus and all he says to us I love you let me say it this way, in obedience to my love for you, I gave myself. Now, all I ask you to do, return that love by deciding to do what? Obey me. Let me say it again. In a certain sense, Jesus obeyed the urge of his love for us. Love requires a response. Love is never inactive. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's yielding to the impulse of love. Jesus yielding to the impulse of love for us. And I chose to say obeying the demand that love placed on him. If you truly love them, save them. And he obeyed that demand of love. And it's, it, is, it is not a negative demand. Now he says, if you love me, you obey the demand of that love. And that demand, that request is, tell me keep my commandments obey me because I had to suffer everything I suffered because the first man disobeyed me tonight someone else needs to make a decision to obey God to obey Jesus a God who went how far the distance to do what save us save you save me do not flaunt your fist in the face of god's love he cannot allow that attitude to go unpunished because the cost to him was so great and there are effects that god will suffer forever there are effects that christ will suffer forever because of this plan of salvation which was the expression of god's love going to distance one of the effects christ still has human form and will have it forever which means he cannot be ever at the same time he has suspended that not lost it suspended it as he wears human flesh what else will he carry forever the marks forever 
That's why he rose from the grave with the marks. The Bible is clear in Philippians 3.21, Who shall fashion our vile body that it shall be like unto his glorious body. The body with which he came from the tomb is the body we will have. But he had the marks when he came from the tomb. And he proved it to the disciples when they did not believe he was real. He said, Behold my hands and my feet, it is I myself. He was pointing to the marks, still on the glorious body. Consider a God with scars. And then think of all the cream you use to remove one pimple from your face. A God with scars forever that he may produce a group of people with no scars. Amen. And then you say no. And then what are you telling God? What Christ suffered put on me. I don't want that love. Take that love. But love and obedience are the same thing. Love and obedience are the same thing. Listen to the second commandment. Exodus 20, read from verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. Here's the connection now. And keep my commandments. Love and obedience are inseparable. And Christ obeyed the impulse of love and he came and died. Tonight I thank God for going the distance to make salvation possible for me. And I accept that sacrifice, I accept that love, and I recommit my life to God. And I really recommit my life to God. Not Let me not say my life. I recommit the life he entrusted to me back to him for service, at any cost for service at any cost that's why I preach the truth directly because I have a responsibility how many of you will say father thank you for that sacrifice I accept it how many will say that I accept that sacrifice on my behalf it's really on your behalf hands down on your behalf now confirm that decision by just standing with me. God is a God who confirms. Just rise to confirm that you accept that sacrifice. No matter what your carnal mind may tell you, God loved you to the degree he was willing to lose Christ. Now I ask you very directly, because I have to let you go. Is there someone who still needs to make a decision to obey God? Is there someone who still needs to make a decision to obey God? And you will make that decision tonight. And by obey God, I mean live in harmony with his law. That's all he requires. Nothing else. His word says, the commandments are the whole duty of man. That's how Jesus lived. And that's how he says every man should live. Who? will finally make the decision i want to obey god in response to that love obey his law including the fourth commandment is there someone who will make that decision tonight for the first time come you've been wrestling struggling you will make the decision tonight come and come as quickly as you can i will obey god in response to that love i've been resisting i cease my resistance i want to live in harmony with god's law which is the law of life love is the fulfilling of the law and the law is made up of 10 including the sabbath commandment you're deciding tonight to obey god come you've been resisting up to this point not because you're bad, because you were nervous, you weren't sure, you heard things for the first time. But make the decision tonight and come. Come right now. Father, I'm deciding tonight to bear you by the power of my risen Savior. Come. I'm calling for those who will make it for the first time. Come. From both sides. From before me, come. Tonight, I decide I want to obey God. 
Obey him from the heart. Come. While you're coming, I'll add a second call. I have been contemplating baptism. Some things were not clear in my mind. Now I've finally decided I want to be baptized. You're making that decision tonight. Just tonight. Come. Two calls. I want to obey God. I've been resisting. I decide tonight I want to obey God. Second call. I've been contemplating baptism or rebaptism. I had questions, uncertainties. Now my mind is settled. I am making the decision. I want to be baptized. Come. God bless you. God bless you. Someone else. Someone else. God bless you, my good brother. God bless you. Do not let anyone hold you back. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let no one hold you back. When it comes to salvation, it's a personal choice. Someone else. I'm deciding tonight to stop disobeying God. That's called one. To obey Him, all His commandments, by His power. Two, I've been considering baptism or rebaptism. I was going back and forth. My mind is made up tonight. Come. Someone else, come. I have to let you go. I went a little late tonight. It's 25 after 7. I suspect most of you are not working tomorrow morning. Someone else. While I'm waiting for you, for the final time, we want to pray with all those who will be baptized tomorrow morning. I want you to come. Come, let's gather one more time. You'll be baptized tomorrow. You've already made a decision. Nothing has changed your mind. Just come. Perhaps as you come, it will encourage those who are timid to come along with you. Come now. You'll be among those reborn tomorrow symbolically. Come. Don't be shy about Jesus. Come. And if you're coming to make the decision for the first time, let the elders know that they may know exactly who you are. If it's the first time, we'll need your name. Someone else come. Today, three calls. One, I have been disobeying God tonight. I've made a decision by His grace. I want to obey my God, live in harmony with His law. Two, I've been going back and forth on the issue of baptism or rebaptism. Tonight, my mind is made up. It's clear, I will be baptized, rebaptized, come. And three, I've already made a decision to be baptized. I've reconfirmed it by coming night after night. I come for the final night to let heaven and earth know I have not changed my mind. Come. We pray and we let you go. And by God's grace, we reassemble tomorrow for the final day of this blessed three-week series. Anyone else? God bless you as you come. And some who will be baptized are not here tonight. We know that. God bless you. My good brother, God bless you. Someone else? When is the first time? I want to obey God. Keep your Sabbath. And I will constantly remind you about the Sabbath issue. That's the problem for most of us. I want to observe his Sabbath. It's the Bible Sabbath. It's the Sabbath Jesus kept. And the Bible just has one. That's the one God made. Anything man made cannot take the place of what God made. You come. Make a courageous decision to obey God. Anyone else? 60 seconds, I pray. Forty-five seconds. The call is to be baptized. If you're doing that for the first time, the call is to make a decision to obey God. And the call is, I've been going back and forth about baptism, but I'm deciding fully and freely tonight. Come. 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds, fifteen seconds, come. Please come. We're talking about life and death. You may not have another opportunity like this. You just may not have it. I don't know. 
But the Bible says now is the accepted time. Now. 60 seconds are up. I will pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Loving Father in heaven, we bow in your presence to thank you for the ministry of your word. We thank you, dear God, that the Spirit has worked energetically tonight to touch hearts, to soften hearts, to break down opposition to truth. Now, dear God, as we bow under the skies, as your Spirit moves, as the angels protect, as you watch from above, I pray from my heart, dear God, you'll accept those who responded to the calls. First call, I am deciding to obey my God. Second call, I have been going back and forth on the issue of baptism or rebaptism. I'm making a definite decision tonight. And the third call, I've already decided to be baptized. I just want to reconfirm it in the presence of heaven and earth. And Father, your sons and daughters have come. I ask you that God move on that heart that is still resisting, that is afraid, that is uncertain, that is nervous. I pray, Father, that you move that person to come. And now I address that person directly. There is someone else who needs to come. Will that person come now? They say, I want to be baptized. First time I'm making a decision. Or I want to be rebaptized because I've been reconverted. Evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2. When a soul is reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. Or you're coming to say, I have decided to stop disobeying my God and living a rebellious life. I want to obey God. Those are the three calls. Anyone else will come as the Spirit moves your heart. Anyone else. Don't be cool, my brothers and sisters. There's nothing cool about hell. Don't try to be cool. God bless you, my brother. Come, come. Don't be cute. Come, be humble. God loves humility, not arrogance. God bless you, sister. Anyone else? Just come. Humble yourself and come. You need Christ, whether you know it or not. And I know you know it. Anyone else? Just come. God bless you. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. Come. Make up your mind to live for God. In a world of corruption and immorality, make a decision. Be one of the persons on whom God can depend. Just turn his back and know my daughter, my son, will not disappoint me or embarrass me before the universe. Be among that group and come. Father in heaven, I conclude this prayer. Believing with what little faith I have that some will make the decision finally between now and tomorrow and so now dear god of love who went the distance bless every man woman boy and girl that responded to the call i am asking you father because you said in jeremiah 29 11 for i know the thoughts that i think toward you saith the lord thoughts of peace and not of evil and the only peace of value in your sight is peace that comes from being right with christ and so bless them with that peace, dear God. Fill them with your spirit that from this point forward, their lives may be a constant lightning flash of your glory to inspire others to live a Christ-centered life. Bless them, bless them, bless them, dear God. And again, I pray, move upon the hearts of those that should come. And just before I say amen, I ask one more time, dear Father, is someone else coming in humility? someone else coming give that life to christ be baptized live an obedient life all his commandments god bless you my young brother god bless you come come god bless you sister god bless you someone else i have to call you i have to plead because i want you saved not lost your friends can cause you to be lost they can't save you anyone else Father in heaven, please accept this prayer. Not because I spoke it, but because I've uttered it in the name of Jesus. Accept it, I pray. Answer it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen.